But I'd be interested to hear you elaborate on some of your bigger failures, if anything comes to mind. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. Can I add a part B to that, sure. too? Um, and I would love to hear about how you navigated them kind of on an emotional sense, because I think in snowboarding, we're all very deeply emotionally tied to our professional lives. And how do you find that balance or separation to be like, it's okay, I'm not going to beat myself up about this? Yeah, so I really define both the progression of the company and my personal career by our oh shit moments. And, you know, I think either where we feel like we've made a mistake or we're doing things that weren't really aligning with our values and where we want to go. So I could run through those if you want. Yes. The first oh shit moment was really in the early days realizing that the sport was going in a freestyle direction. And we were coming from that East Coast ski race mentality. And they were starting to build half pipes and stuff. And, and you know, we were really behind the curve there. I think with all these oh shit moments, we not only learn from them, but then we end up you know, taking it the other way and becoming a leader the other way. So the first moment was really realizing we had missed the whole freestyle trend. Another was when we were in Europe and uh, I had a uh, Swiss distributor who got a run of boards that were defective. And so this is like 1987, all the bindings pulled out about 80% of his boards or something while people were riding. Oh, my God. <clears throat> yeah. That was a moment we became obsessive about quality. We were like, this is never, ever going to happen again. And I think because you're a leader and you're a pioneer, the market forgives you pretty quickly. But we were like, we will never, you know, quality became our obsession after that. I think the third oh shit moment was we were heading in the wrong direction. Again, we had made a decision we wanted to continue to grow. And we had a leader at the time who said, let's go into board sports. We'll become a surf, skate, snow company. Thinking that we could bring our technology and R&D to those industries and gain legitimacy. We also, as you know, purchased some snowboard brands, Forum, <coughs> Foursquare, and um, we said we can bring them along technologically, but produce them cheaper or whatever. It was the wrong move. It was just the wrong move. We didn't bring any legitimacy to those brands, and we couldn't really help them from a technological point of view. And what was interesting at the time was we're messing around over here. I mean, I think at one point we had 16 brands. Wow. 16 brands. And we're messing around over here trying to keep these <laughs> from breaking even or whatever. And the Burton lifestyle product was growing. Like all of a sudden, we never thought people would want to wear Burton off the mountain. Right, We were committed to making stuff for the mountain. All of a sudden, our hoodies and our T-shirts and our baseball caps, they're growing, especially in Europe and in Canada, where we're really two of the places they were growing. And so we're like, hey, we've got to focus on the mothership. So we did what I called Project Focus, and we divested of ourselves of all those brands. Um, and we kept Anon, you know, Anon was always our brand, um, and Jake always just thought nobody wanted to be head to toe Burton, you know, so they, we named the goggle something else. But obviously we kept Anon, and we focused on Burton. And, you know, again, a mistake, painful awful, um, cost us some credibility, and but we corrected. Um, another big oh shit moment for me was with women. You know, we always saw ourselves as being a really inclusive community. 
And I'll never forget, I think it was 2001, Jake and I were in a um, meeting of all our global directors from around the world, 25 people, two women in the room. And it was actually Jake who turned to me and said, this does not bode well for our future. I think he knew at a gut entrepreneurial level that you had to have diversity in order to be sustainable long term. And again, being privately held, we can be thinking longer term. We can correct those mistakes by investing now in our women's leadership, you know. And then another big oh shit moment was with sustainability. You know, we were always like, hey, fuck, we make, you know, a product that requires chemicals that come from fossil fuels. You know, we can't be seen as greenwashing or whatever. And we never really had our own auditing program. We were just like, oh, we're in the same factory as those brands like Patagonia and North Face. So we're, we're okay, you know. And I guess it was about 2002, three that um, I just really all of a sudden had a wake up call and said, oh man, we got to get on top of this. This is real. Climate change is real. I think our industry didn't want to talk about it. They literally didn't want to talk about it. Um, and so again, we went from being behind the curve to being a leader. I mean, we're the only hard goods company in the world any kind of hard goods, skiing or snowboarding, that's B certified now. Um, and then lastly was more recently with the George Floyd murder, you know, kind of really, oh shit, we have not done enough to make people of color and the LGBTQ community feel part of. Again, I think as a community, we think of ourselves as so inclusive and inviting but I think with some of these marginalized group, including women, you've got to be proactive. You know, you've got to find ways of breaking down the barriers. And so for the long-term sustainability of the company, you know, we've got to have diversity. So I think these oh shit moments where we realize we're not living up to our values or we're not doing enough um, or we've made a mistake, but then we were really good at turning them around, again, because we're privately held and we can move quickly.